Hey everyone, and if you've had a full month and a half of pure rain like I did in Brittany, then you might be in need of the Linux and open source news, just to cheer you up. So here we go. So this week we have the EU forcing Microsoft to open Windows just a little bit more and let users do what they actually want to do on their systems using the services that they actually want to use. We also have AMD teasing some interesting stuff about AI, open source, and hardware in general. We have a nice big roadmap for Peertube, which should fix most remaining issues with that platform. And we also have the usual slew of stuff for gaming, for the kernel, for KDE, for GNOME. And we also have this segue to our sponsor. This video is sponsored by Thunderbird. Most of you probably know about it, but for those who don't, it's an all-in-one suite that handles email, calendar, contacts, tasks, RSS feeds, and chats. Thunderbird recently received a giant update with a full redesign of the app that makes it easier than ever to set up your accounts and to be productive. The interface is very customizable with multiple choices for interface density, view modes, panels, and the ability to place any button you need in the top bar. After this update, Thunderbird is now my email and calendar client of choice. Also, it's fully open source, it's free of charge, and it's available for any Linux distribution, Windows, and Mac OS. So whether you used Thunderbird in the past or not, click the link in the description below and give the new release a try. You will not regret it. So there is a change coming for proprietary operating systems, or at least for Windows. Microsoft will have to let users of Windows 11 disable Bing, remove Microsoft Edge, and add custom web search provider to the OS search feature. The EU's Digital Market Act will come into effect on March 2024, and it regulates gatekeepers, or companies that have a sizable market share, big user numbers, and generally just have the capability to prevent other companies from entering certain markets by bundling various apps and services together and restricting what users can or can't do on their own devices. This obviously includes Microsoft and Windows, since they basically have a monopoly on the PC operating system market, and they regularly use this to force their own apps and services onto their users. So Microsoft will now have to be more interoperable and let users remove pre-installed apps and change default settings. Microsoft will also let users uninstall the camera app, Cortana, and the Photos app, and they will finally follow the user's default browser preference to open all links. Unfortunately, these changes won't propagate outside of the EU, although they will also come to Windows 10 in the future, apparently. And I really wish Microsoft would just give up all these monopolistic abuses and practices everywhere, not just in the EU, but at least that's something that us citizens of the European Union will be able to enjoy if we ever decide to go back to Windows, which is not happening for me. Now, in the same vein, the Free Software Foundation Europe wrote an open letter to the EU to try and push them to give people more freedom on their devices. The letter was signed by 147 different organizations and 3,000 people, which admittedly, at the scope of the EU, is very small. And it asks four main things. First, letting people choose freely the operating system and the software that's running on their devices. Second, choosing freely their services providers to connect to the internet, but also to run their email, calendar, and everything else. Third, making sure that all devices are interoperable and compatible with open standards. And finally, publishing the code for drivers, tools, and interfaces needed to operate or repair a device all of that under a Libra license. The goal is to obviously break down the silos that are created by software and or hardware manufacturers, and to let people use their hardware exactly how they see fit without any arbitrary limitation. And I am all for it, and the EU is probably the place to ask for stuff like that, but I personally doubt all of this will be followed by any real measures. We already got advances on right to repair and on breaking down what the EU calls gatekeepers, which will result in sideloading being possible on iOS devices and in various big services becoming more interoperable. But I doubt the EU will force manufacturers to develop everything as open source or to leave bootloaders unlocked. 
Still, interesting push, interesting letter, and I hope it will result in something good. Fingers crossed, but I am not holding my breath. Now, AMD is planning something, teasing open standards and open source work for their Advancing AI event. This thing is planned for December the 6th, and on Twitter they posted something talking about open standards, open source, and generally looks like they want to make sure AI work is open. This could just mean that AMD would add Linux support and open source Ryzen AI, a dedicated AI engine included in the latest AMD CPUs for laptop, which would be cool in and of itself, even for non-AI related tasks, as a coprocessor can always be useful for various things, even if it's optimized for just one task. But there are also suppositions that this could be a bit bigger than just AI, and could mean that ROCM would support a lot more of AMD's devices. ROCM being a complete software stack, which is open source, and lets you use way more of your GPU for compute tasks. This could be more than just a supposition, since AMD already said that more hardware would support ROCM later in the year. In all cases, if it's open source, it's good news. I don't personally much care about AI, but if it's going to be the next big thing, which unfortunately it looks like it is, then at least having good support for all hardware accelerators for these technologies on Linux would be a boon for our platform. And if it's related to any other kind of hardware, then all the better, and I'm all for it. Now, I covered Framasoft in a video a while back. They are a French collective working to try and de-Google internet through free software and a bunch of services, including Peertube, which they develop. They've published a nice roadmap for what's coming next to their tools, and there are some good things. Peertube, notably, is bound to become a lot more user-friendly, with support for video chapters, thumbnails in the progress bar, replacing a video with an updated one for creators, stress tests for instance managers, and password-protected videos. All of this coming before the end of November 2023. But for 2024, they also have big plans with the ability to import and export your account between instances, to moderate comments directly for creators or through keywords, to separate the audio and video streams to let people only listen to the audio, but they also plan a UX redesign after an audit, a showcase instance of Peertube, plus an official Peertube mobile app for Android and iOS, letting people have a much better experience with Peertube. Of course, it will be left to each individual instance to update to this new version, but seeing that these are so good in terms of improvements for users, I doubt any instance will not update to Peertube 6 at the end of November and will not follow the next updates coming all along 2024. I really like Peertube, I'm on it, there's a link in the description below to follow me there if you want to. And Framasoft also updated a lot of their other services and offerings. You'll find all the details in the link in the description of the video. Now let's talk desktop environments. First with KDE, and it looks like the Plasma 6 Alpha has the developers kind of swamped in bug reports, which is a good thing, since it means the final release is way more likely to be polished if all these bugs are identified early and fixed. On top of this, Plasma panels gained the ability to intelligently auto-hide, also called they can dodge windows. When the panel is touched by a window, it hides away, and if not, it stays visible. This is a behavior I got used to with a GNOME dock extension at the time, and I can't wait to get it back in Plasma, because auto-hide by itself sucks. KWIN also now supports Wayland's Presentation Time Protocol, which will ensure smooth video playback and good audio and video sync. Cute widgets-based apps will now look much better, with less borders inside the app and a more consistent appearance with menus and lists. More icons were created for the symbolic icon set as well to ensure a better-looking notification tray. The default Breeze theme for console now uses more legible colors, the Wayland session should open apps faster now, and there were a lot of smaller UX and usability fixes to streamline how the apps, the dialogues, and the settings pages look and feel. As per GNOME, it's, as always, all about the apps. Workbench got a big update, letting you now use Python to prototype GNOME apps, and it also now supports blueprint formatting, 
and the offline documentation viewer is now split into a separate app called Biblioteca. There are also updates to Halftone, the app that lets you turn your photos into pixel art, to Fragments, the torrent client that now stops uploading and downloading when switching to a metered connection, to Dosage, the app to help you follow and take your medication, and to Parabolic, the video downloader app now available for Windows as well. Denaro, the personal finance manager, got some bug fixes and now uses the latest Libadvita style and the quality assessment infrastructure to automate tests in GNOME is now closer to being open to all GNOME apps. It's really cool stuff for Plasma and for the GNOME app ecosystem. I say this all the time, but it's so exciting to see all these changes every week to our major desktops. It's a good time to use these things. And now let's talk about the Linux kernel 6.6, which is going to be this year's LTS version with three years of support, but also 6.7. And yes, I said three years of support, not two. The shortened support period isn't apparently happening yet, but yeah, let's talk about 6.7. It's a pretty big future update. The first release candidate has been published and it brings a lot of stuff. First, there's initial NVIDIA GSP support for the Nuvo driver meaning these drivers will get the ability to reclock NVIDIA GPUs after boot and thus get much, much better performance. This is also an important piece of the puzzle for the NVK drivers to get a fully open source stack to run on NVIDIA GPUs. 6.7 will also remove support for the Intel Itanium architecture as it's basically unused and unmaintained. Support for handling alt mode through DisplayPort was also added to the USB Type-C driver and the Bcache FS file system has landed as well. This is a new file system that aims to compete with better FS and ZFS with snapshots, compression and a lot more. Now, initial tests by Foronix seem to show slightly lower performance with Bcache FS than with other file systems in a lot of cases, but it's still the first time it's merged in the Linux kernel, so things might get better before the official release. Now, personally, I am very excited by everything happening around NVIDIA and open source, and I can't wait to run all my NVIDIA devices with a fully open source stack, even though I'm pretty sure the performance will be much lower than with the proprietary drivers. I might make a video comparing those two when the new version of the kernel is actually out and the Nuvo drivers are updated as well. And let's finish this with the gaming news. First, we have the release of the Steam Deck OLED. I mentioned it in the previous episode, and it basically replaces the higher-end SKUs of the LCD Steam Deck. It has an OLED display that refreshes at 90 Hz, it is a bit bigger than the previous one, and it supports HDR. But it's not just that, there are a lot of updates to the joysticks, to the inputs, but also to the APU. It's still AMD, but it's 6 nanometer now, and the battery has been increased from 40 watt hour to 50 watt hour, so in the end, it's about 30 to 40% more battery life for the Steam Deck. You can already buy it from Valve's website, provided it wasn't sculpted to oblivion by idiots, of course. And to support this, we also got a stable update to SteamOS. So, of course, it now supports the OLED model, but it also brings HDR settings when an external display that supports it is connected. The LCD version of the Steam Deck now emulates the sRGB color gamut, and you can enable variable refresh rate if the external display you're connected to supports it. Additionally, the deck now disables compositing in some scenarios to improve performance and the latency has been improved as well. The firmware of the deck was also updated bringing voltage offset settings and the Steam Deck Docs firmware also got an update to support variable refresh rate. And if you use the desktop mode on your Steam Deck, you will also get an update to the Arch Linux base and the KDE desktop. It's a nice big update for the Steam Deck, whether you use the old one like me or the new OLED model, well worth the upgrade. Now the Wine Wayland driver is still making good progress with improved high DPI support. This new part of Wayland support in Wine now adds support for scaled displays, although it is not per monitor yet and it seems like it has to be set in the Wine settings themselves. The next part is already underway with Vulkan support being enabled for Wayland and Wine. With all of this, native Wayland support for Wine looks to be in pretty good shape, which means we might soon be able to get rid of X Wayland to play games 
or even to get rid of X11 altogether for some people and benefit from a nice performance boost in the process. And speaking of Wine, Wine 8.20 is out with more direct music work and protocol associations now being exported to the desktop. There were 20 bugs fixed as well, including for Max Payne, for Warframe, Neverwinter Nights 2 on GOG, and more. Wine 9.0 should be next, which should also mean that Proton 9 should come out with a lot of bug fixes and performance improvements based on all that work in Wine. Now, Wine and Proton have been moving so fast, they're in a great state these days. And with Wayland support coming probably in 2024, then I think most of our problems with Linux gaming are out of the way, except maybe for some anti-cheat. Now, what won't be a problem is running Linux on our sponsor's devices. Tuxedo makes laptops and desktops that ship with Linux out of the box. The devices are made to run Linux, not Windows. And why is that important, you might ask? Well, it's because it saves you all the hassle and all the handwork and all the manual labor of trying to retrofit Linux onto a computer that only officially supports Windows. Tuxedo has a big range of devices that will cover all your needs and all the price points. They're all customizable, all the laptops are openable, repairable and upgradable, and you can customize them pretty heavily with your keyboard layout, your own logo and a bunch of different components. I only use Tuxedo devices these days. My laptop, which is also my editing station, is from Tuxedo. My SteamOS console is from Tuxedo. They are really good devices, so click the link in the description below if you need a new device and you want to make sure Linux runs on it. So, thanks everyone for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, don't hesitate to like, to subscribe, to turn on notifications, to write a comment. And if you didn't like the video, there's always that dislike button and you can tell me why in the comments as well. And if you really enjoyed the channel, you can, well, support it. There are plenty of links in the description to do just that as well. So, thanks for watching and I guess you'll see me in the next one. Bye!